Uh, welcome to the American Medical Athletic Association's 24th Annual Sports Medicine Symposium, Symposium in conjunction with the Marine Corps Marathon. Um, I'm Dr. Fran O'Connor from Uniform Services University. I'm the program chair, and I think we've got a great program for you today. Um, and uh, we are starting off with a bang with uh, Dr. Robert Nerschel. Uh, we would not be here today if it were not for Dr. Robert Nerschel. Um, I want to tell you a little bit about him. Uh, Dr. Nerschel is an attending physician here at Virginia uh, Hospital Center. Uh, he's an orthopedic surgeon. Uh, he is the founding director of the Nerschel Orthopedic Center for Sports Medicine and Joint Reconstruction. He's also the founding medical director of Virginia Sports Medicine Institute and the Orthopedic Sports Medicine Fellowship Program as well as the Primary Care Sports Medicine Fellowship Program in conjunction with this institution as well as Georgetown University. He's an associate clinical professor, orthopedic surgeon, Georgetown. A privilege to introduce Dr. Nerschel, who's going to speak to us today, as you see, about the good, the bad, the ugly, the future of tendinopathy. Warm welcome for Dr. Nerschel. Thank you, Fran. It's a, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, I hope you enjoy the day. Uh, the, uh, as Fran says, it looks like a, like a wonderful symposium, and Fran always does a great job in organizing these things. Actually, Fran was my first fellow in, in, uh, in 1990 uh, as a primary care uh, fellow. And he came in and he said, I'd like to spend a year with you. And I said, uh, who's going to pay your salary? And he said, the Army. And I said, you're hired. <laughs> and so Fran has done wonderful things uh, over time. And, uh, and I'm sure you'll learn to appreciate him a great deal. The uh, disclosure is uh, <coughs> medical sports counterforce braces. Actually, you probably he heard the term counterforce. I'm the one who introduced that term, actually, <laughs> in the 1970s. So up to that point, there was no counterforce. Uh, uh, in terms of braces. And also, I, <clears throat> I'm a stockholder in 10X High Frequency, uh, and we'll touch on 10X a little bit at the, at the end of this talk. The uh, past tells us uh, what we think we know is, is often wrong. And the myths of the standard of care, actually, I wrote an wrote a, uh, a, um, editorial in the AMA News in uh, 1988, uh, which pointed out that the standard of care is a legal term, it's not a medical term. Uh, and uh, that very often uh, the standard of care basically does, doesn't mean quality of care. The medical community thinks that's the case, but it, it's really not. Uh, standard uh, estrogen for postmenopausal <laughs> women, 40 years. Uh, Semmelweis is my hero. Uh, in 1847, uh, he figured out that uh, <coughs> that it would be a good idea to wash your hands. Uh, at that time, they were starting to do cadaver work, and the hair professors in Vienna uh, basically didn't bother to wash their hands and delivered babies, and they had a 25% sepsis rate uh, for the aristocratic women. Uh, <clears throat> and Semmelweis basically was outside the standard of care. He was thrown out of the Vienna Medical Society, uh, became depressed, was put in an asylum, and he died 12 days later probably injured or, or harmed by the, uh, uh, by the uh, guards. So Semmelweis basically would have saved literally thousands of lives uh, until Joseph Lister came along and then they figured out about germs, but uh, uh, Semmelweis was outside the standard of care. Another example, Ian Smiley, uh, meniscus is vestigial, that's what he taught. Uh, and he had five editions of his book uh, and he was in the Royal College of Surgeons in Scotland. He was the gold medal winner, officer in the Order of the British Empire, World Authority on Injuries of the Knee. He invented knives, uh, which were used in operating rooms worldwide, and total meniscectomy was a standard of care <laughs> up until 1985. Uh, by 1985, he had personally performed 7,000 total meniscectomies. Smiley's total meniscectomy, the standard of care, harm millions of people. So the successful results, I like Jack Houston's uh, comment, uh, nothing ruins successful results except by uh, 
uh, doing a, a long-term uh, review of the situation. Jack Houston was the first editor of the American Journal of Sports Medicine. Now, I wrote this article <coughs> on uh, doing reconstruction of the ACL in 1967. Jack Houston uh, was the discusser of my article. Actually, it was one of the first uh, reconstruction articles at ACL in the world, as a matter of fact. Houston said in discussing my article that the ACL reconstruction will never work uh, because synovial fluid will destroy, will destroy the graft. Uh, Jack Houston was the father of sports medicine. He was dead wrong. Uh, Charles Neer, uh, b article in JVJS uh, 1972 at the rotator cuff fails by impingement. This was Neer's algorithm which said basically that the acromion basically destroyed the cuff. This was uh, some of the articles in, the, in depiction. They even got it wrong from the points of view uh, that they pointed out that uh, basically that front end there in, a, in an article, uh, they had it backwards because, as we said, the type 3 acromion was on the other side, the medial side. Uh, this is what they were calling type 3 acromions. had nothing to do with heredity. This was a traction spur on the, on the coracochromial ligament. Uh, the guys in New York at Columbia Presbyterian had it all wrong. So Dr. Neer was the premier shoulder surgeon in the world, 1970-1995. Acromioplasty was accepted without thinking, was a standard of care worldwide. As a matter of fact, it's still considered in many orthopedic surgeons, particularly those who don't do sports medicine. So even today, it's somewhat considered the standard of care. Anyway, the problem with Neer uh, was multiple, but the, most of the time the failure of the cuff was on, on the joint side, the articular side, not on the bursal side, amongst other things. I pointed this out to Dr. Neer in 1984. He never talked to me again. <laughs> so failed cuff surgery, when you're doing acromioplasty, these are all the things that were happening. Deltoid detachment, uh, loss of acromial lever, and this poor lady is an example of, a, of, a, an, a, a, of an acromioplasty via the near, near techniques. <coughs> so the near acromioplasty has harmed the acromion and the deltoid and compromised millions of patients undergoing rotator cuff surgery. So in 1984, uh, I, I knew this, and this is when I brought it up to Dr. Near. His answer to my, my query was silence. Uh, in 1989, I published this in the, in the American Academy of Orthopedic Surgery Instructional Course Lectures. And what happens is that the cuff fails by tension load and fatigue. And what really happens then is that uh, up in there here, the cuff fails first, and then the humeral head goes up, and then you'll create bursitis and, and reactive uh, bony exostosis underneath the acromion. They had it backwards, 180 degrees. And as I said, even to this day in the orthopedic community, they still teach impinge, ac acromial impingement. It's dead wrong. So what you really need to do is, is, to, is to go where the money is, repair the cuff. And if you want to clean out the bursa, that's fine. But acromioplasty is quite, an, quite, another, quite another issue. So I gave this talk to a lot of orthopedic surgeons around the world. In 2001, I was in Brooklyn, the Brooklyn Orthopedic Society. After I gave the talk, I said, don't do acromioplasties. Here I am in the bastion of New York where this all came from. Uh, first question uh, from an orthopedic surgeon was, but Dr. Nerschel, if we don't do acromioplasty, we get paid less. <clears throat> How do you respond to something like that? Now, tendonitis, dead wrong. Uh, the, uh, there are no tendon inflammation, maybe adjacent chemical inflammatory, uh, uh, probably, but uh, there's no inflammatory cells in this tissue. So in 1979, you know, when we published our first article on, t on tennis elbow operations and we looked at the histology uh, of, uh, of this tissue, as we said, we, we labeled it angiofibroblastic tendinosis. Unbeknownst to me, Purdue. Uh, in 1976 in Italy basically published an article about the histology of the Achilles tendon it was the same, no inflammatory cells. And so uh, disorganized immature collagen, non-functional vascular elements, no inflammatory cells. 
So we changed the name to angiofibroblastic tendinosis. And this is what it looks like. Uh, all of this stuff right here, you see. This is normal tendon, the white shiny stuff. This is abnormal tendon. So we first published this in JBJS, which was a premier orthopedic journal in 1979. So the tendon fails again by tension overload, fatigue, and you end up with failed, uh, failed tendon. And this is what it looks like histologically. Slide on your left basically is all kinds of unhappy, unhappy cells, but no inflammatory cells. Slide on your right is a, is a normal tendon. Barry Crashauer, one of my fellows, uh, did electron microscopy in this, and this was published in JBGS in 1998. And up on top, you see that this is a, a, a functional vascular elements and a functional fibroblast. And when you look down the slide on your left, this is normal collagen in a normal tendon, and this is what tendinosis looks like, the collagen, the slide on your right. So as Barry used to say, on the left, it's a nice uh, Kansas wheat field. On the right, it's a Kansas wheat field that just got hit by a cyclone. And so this is what the collagen looks like. It's uh, really totally disorganized. Now, there's uh, tendinosis all over the place. Uh, in other words, there are multiple tendons which uh, have this. And, and a lot of this was misconstrued, by the way, as a fibromyalgia, but uh, uh, actually, very often, this is a tendinosis issue rather than a fibromyalgia issue, but, but it could be, could be either, but it's very often confused. Uh, the most common tendon areas, of course, are the elbow, shoulder, plantar fascia, Achilles, and, and the patellar tendon. Those are the most common. Now, uh, tendon failure, uh, heredity plays a big role in this. Uh, and uh, one of the things we, we noted was uh, what was called uh, Mesenchymal syndrome, which I coined uh, years ago. Uh, so people are born sometimes with, uh, with lousy tendons. Uh, mechanical design also plays a role. And then overuse factors also play a role. So very often it's said that overuse factors is what the causation is. But very often people come uh, to a high demand environment with lousy tendons to begin with. They were born that way. And so the mesenchymal syndrome, generalized tendinosis, 15% of the cases I see would have tennis elbow, also have rotator cuff issues. They very often have carpal tunnel syndrome, they have cubital tunnel syndrome, very often will have hip tendinosis problems, plantar fascia. So this is a group, 15% of the group basically who just have bad tendons. It's probable collagen cross link deficiency. So what causes pain in tendinosis? There are a lot, of, a lot of reasons, or at least uh, citing theories, but we really don't know. So uh, we really need to work harder somewhere in the basic science to figure it out. Now, runner's knee chondromalacia, of course, is an articular issue, but uh, associated problems are patellar tendinosis, particularly at the inferior pole. And so, uh, runners basically uh, will come with all kinds of hereditary deficiencies. Uh, so they have the quadriceps angle problem, patellar subluxation, valgus angle, shallow femoral grooves, weak quads, pronated feet, uh, tight hamstrings, and then finally repetitive overload. So, so all of these things then basically uh, play a role, but if you come into a high demand environment, as I said, with, uh, with deficient tissue uh, to begin with, as I said, uh, you're a sitting duck. So as we say, a thin tire looking for a nail, uh, and the nail finds them. This is one of my patients. He, he proudly uh, uh, sent me this picture. He and his daughter are finishing the Boston Marathon, uh, and he was so delighted. To, uh, but take a look at uh, what's happened here. Uh, he's a pronated foot, externally rotated, valgus position. So he had, he had patellar tendinosis. Uh, and you can see why. Even look at the other foot, which is in the float phase. It's externally rotated, the leg. Look at his daughter. His legs are straight. So in any, any event, then, as you said, repetitive overload, yes, but, but he came into the environment uh, with hereditary deficiencies to begin with. Anyway, he finished the Boston Marathon in pretty good time. Tennis elbow. Uh, this was a butte. This is what got me into this in the first place. I, I got tennis elbow at age 35, uh, hitting tennis balls. 
Uh, I read the first two articles in the JVJS, and uh, they both said the same thing. Uh, tennis elbow is a misnomer. I've seen, never seen a tennis player with tennis elbow. Well, these guys were idiots. Uh, <coughs> <coughs> so at this point, I decided I'd better do a little research, and, uh, and the rest, as we say, is history. So tennis elbow actually, in 1883, the British Journal was reflective of that. In a British Journal at those times, you could write letters in and uh, you know, try and get a response from members of the British Journal. So in 1883, a dentist writes in and he says, I hit a backhand and it really hurt my elbow and then I was pulling out a molar and my arm was so sore I couldn't use it. And uh, I think I have to rest, but I can't because I have to make a living. Um, the next month, in uh, December of uh, 1883, Dr. O'Sullivan writes in and says, uh, if you use uh, continuous electrical current, it might help. Actually, Dr. O'Sullivan uh, was on, on track for something. Uh, anyway, this was in 1883, December. Now, the pathological uh, areas in medial are, are usually the flexor carpi radialis and the pronators ter teri. Those are the things that fail in medial elbow. Also, ulnar nerve is involved at least 30% of the time and very often up to 50% of the time. So you have to pay attention to the ulnar nerve as well as the medial elbow tendinosis. Lateral side is 100% is the ECRB and at least 30% and up to 50% now of the EDC, at least the anterior medial edge of the EDC is involved. Uh, and then there's some other things which are iatrogenic cortisone atrophy and so forth. Now, the ECRB is here, and the ECRL is here, lateral epicondyle is there, the EDC is here, and the lateral gutter is there. Uh, in injections, very often, folks are basically pummeling the lateral epicondyle and call it lateral epicondylitis. Of course, it's not the lateral epicondyle and it's not an itis. Uh, so basically doing multiple injections in the wrong place basically doesn't do any good. Now, the phases of tendon repair are inflammatory, proliferative remodeling, and consolidation. And in the early going, it's a type 3 uh, collagen, and then it becomes type 1 of collagen. And then consolidation is a mature fibro tendon. Now, the current basic concepts then are number one, then, in essence, is to improve uh, the quality of the tissue. Number two is to pay attention to the force loads, eliminate the abuse if you can. And number three is pain control. So those are the basic concepts of what we're trying to do here non-surgically. Non now, pain control is not a cure. There's no biological stimulus, so passing out pills and rest doesn't do anything as far as cure. And that, of course, was a template for many years to just say, oh, well, let's do anti-inflammatories and rest, see? But it's not a cure. So cortisone injections, it doesn't heal, but Pain control is helpful because if you're comfortable, you'll do a better job on your rehab exercises. And then over three injections in one area in 1980, we noted in surgical specimens that there was tendon damage that occurred from the cortisone. That was usually using Depomedrol at that time. So Depomedrol is not a good choice uh, in, in, our, in our experience. But anyway, three in one area. So you've heard that term, and, and that came from me also from the point of view that patients will come in and say, hey, I heard that. You know, don't do too many cortisone. Anyway, that came from me way back when. Now, the biological goals of tendinosis are neovascularization and collagen production. Uh, that's what you're trying to accomplish. That's the cure. And so fibro, you end up with fibrotendin or possibly uh, regeneration to normal, possibly. Healthy fibrotendin is pain-free. <coughs> So if you end up with a healthy fibro tendon, you've changed the neighborhood from unhealthy to healthy. Uh, and so you've solved the problem as far as the patient is concerned if you get to, get to fibro tendon. Now, the treatment itself, then, as we said, is whether you can get to regeneration or, fi or fibro healing with rehab exercises. And what we do now almost always works if you do it well. So, so the concepts in our pain control promote cure by rehab exercise, fitness, ret retention, or improve traditional transitional exercise to sport and control abuse from the sport. Those are the basic concepts. And uh, there was a wonderful article that was written by then Major O'Connor uh, 
which is what's called the five-step uh, treatment of overuse injuries. Janet Sobel and myself have participated in that. It was published originally in October of 1992. And that still is the gold standard. It's a marvelous gold standard, and it works just fine. So we also wrote a book called Arm Care, which is 90 pages, which was specific to the elbow, which has the same principles in it. Now, the future. Uh, the concept of regener regeneration to normal tissue is attractive, but can this be achieved, and is it better than fibrotendon if you go back to regeneration of normal tendon or not? So PRP, blood, stem cells, tendon cells, we're, we're going to concentrate on just the PRP side of it today, but all of these things are sort of in play at this point. Now, the idea is, of course, as you know, is to spin down blood so you get a high concentration of, of platelets, which have, um, which have, of course, the uh, growth factors in it. And so these are the growth factors. Now, the whole idea, then, is to say, well, the PDGF, which is the growth factor, you get fibroblastic proliferation, collagen synthesis, and so forth. Uh, so will that uh, uh, bring these tendons back to normal? Centrifuge variations, as you know, uh, various centrifuges, you get d different variation in what the concentration of the, of the PRP is. So maybe that plays a role in success or failure. So uh, does that work? Is it a fast fix? Does it work? Is there value to the patient? Now, you notice that Major O'Connor in, in 1992 has become Colonel O'Connor. And I talked to him recently, and I said, uh, does this stuff work? Uh, with, when, what you're doing uh, when you inject it into tendons and his response is uh, as you see a crapshoot <laughs> now the issue is this uh, PRP studies currently are all the rage but so were the studies about the theories of Houston Smiley and Near so this was the start of it all and this is Alan Mishra who's at Stanford but he was a Georgetown medical student and actually he rotated through our clinic uh, and he did this study in, uh, uh, when was it, 1996 or 2006. Interestingly enough, you see he had 140 patients and only 20 failed the conservative treatment. So that meant that he only had a 14% failure of the conservative treatment uh, to begin with. Anyway, he lost, uh, he lost his control so that the, the results of the study are really muted on the basis of you lost your control. Uh, anyway, that started the gold rush to PRP, so as we say down here. And now there are many articles, uh, as you know, uh, some of them positive and some of them negative. So as we say, as Dr. O'Connor says, it's a crapshoot at this point. Now there's some other issues involved, and that is why would it be a crapshoot? And uh, one would be there's no advantage over placebo. Uh, two is that injection is in the wrong place, which is usually the case, uh, and or there's failure to understand variation in tendis, tendinosis tissue. And we're going we're gonna to talk about this. Everybody thinks, well, tendinosis is tendinosis. Wrong. So can all tendons be healed, all tendinosis be healed and regenerated? The answer is no. And in the emulsifying gray, gray unhappy mucoid tendon weeping of edema or tendinosis exceeding 50% in thickness is destined to fail non-surgical treatment. So you have to know that in advance. So here's mucoid uh, tendinosis. Now you see all of this gray stuff in here is all, uh, all emulsified tissue, uh, normal tendon over there. But all of this stuff, uh, there's no way that you're going to resolve that with PRP injections. So the choice and success of tendinosis treatment is dependent upon the volume and the character of tendon failure. And no PRP study understood or has taken into account the variation in tendinosis tissue. So if you take a look at this, all of this is the medial elbow and all of this destruction of this tissue, there is absolutely no way that you're gonna solve this problem non-surgically. Also, you can have rupture of the, of the tissue. So this is a world-class tennis player, and you see that the ECRB is totally, totally ruptured and pulled off. So if you're going to be injecting PRP in a totally ruptured tendon, 
uh, there's absolutely no opportunity for that, for that to happen. So again, the pathological staging, then tendinosis greater than 50% or tendinosis plus rupture. Now there are some key clues uh, as to tell you uh, major tendinosis change or not. And one of them is we did some pain phases a while back and we'll get to the phases six and seven. MRI will help you, multiple cortisone injections. You have a patient with multiple cortisone. Uh, calcification on x-ray. Diagnostic ultrasound might help you and symptoms over nine months. These are clues uh, that uh, you're dealing with a major t tendinosis problem. Now the pain phase is uh, six and seven. Uh, down here at number seven, if you have a patient with pain at rest that disturbs the sleep, that means that there's major tendinosis damage. And the likelihood of trying to solve that problem non-surgically is, is essentially nil. Now imaging, the MRI is the gold standard. Ultrasound has been a very helpful diagnostic tool, but we're gonna get into whether or not it's a good treatment uh, tool at the same time. Uh, and then x-ray. Now here are some examples. Of, you see a big wad of calcification which is sitting in this Achilles tendon. Uh, if you see uh, tendinosis tissue uh, by MRI here, this was one of my patients who was ambassador of the United States to Sweden. And actually, we did a 10x on this. And when we hit that spot, uh, he, said it, he said it immediately. And he said, boy, you really found a spot. And uh, so, uh, but you see there's significant damage in, in the inferior pole of the, of the, uh, of the uh, patella. Otherwise, here's a diseased Achilles tendon and a healthy Achilles tendon with the, with the imaging with the ultrasound. So the key to success is you must understand the anatomy and the pathology. And if, and if you know the character of the pathology, should you inject a, a PRP? And if you hope to success, not in a mucoid tendon. So ultrasound then tendinosis identification with needle placement, is it value to the patient or is it more value to the doctor? And it reminds me of that Brooklyn orthopedic surgeon that says if we don't do that, we don't get paid. So the location of tendinosis is clearly identified by the location of palpable tenderness. Knowing the anatomy is king. So an elbow injection lateral is under the ECRB, not in the epicondyle and not multiple punctures. And so again, where, it, where that goes is then right here. Not there, not there, not there, but there. Uh, and so a surgical uh, look at this is again, the lateral epicondyle is down here. This is where the ECRB is. The ECRL is here and the EDC is over there. So if you inject here, there, or there, you're not gonna get anywhere. You gotta be there. So you have to understand the anatomy. Now if you're looking at this with an ultrasound, there's no way to differentiate the, the anatomy. So if you think you need to be proficient in ultrasound injection procedure, can you learn it in a weekend course? Uh, I don't think so. Now the lesson for injection procedures, anatomy is king. Now tendinosis surgery, if the diagnosis is clear and non-operative fails and the quality of life is unacceptable to the patient, it's worthwhile to consider surgery. Now if we use the O'Connor protocol, uh, less than 10% of folks will come to surgery. Now the quality of tendon surgery is number one, clearly identify uh, the tendon and surgically remove it. Uh, leave the good stuff alone and as I, my inertialism to telling our fellows uh, sitting in 1990, get the hell out of there before something bad happens. So lateral tennis elbow, Holman in 1922 in the German literature, he came up with this, the standard of care until 1979, release all the tendon ex extensors, doing a tenotomy. Tenotomy is a bad word in Dr. Nurschel's armamentarium. Uh, no identification of the pathology and the success was 50%. So what you do with a tenotomy is you weaken the force generators, but you leave the pathological tissue behind. The whole idea of the operation is get the pathological tissue out of there. It's like a pebble in your shoe. You want to get it out, not just, not just cut uh, indiscriminately normal tissue and everything else. 
So the section specific to the pathology, not a tenotomy, ECRV and EDC, many open 88 cases, 97% success rate, three-year follow-up uh, in 1979, we published this first article. And there's a tiny little incision, you can get in and get out in 18 minutes. And again, here's the, here's the anatomy. The lateral epicondyle is here, EDC is here, the ECRB is here, the ECRL is there. There's no way you can differentiate all of that on an ultrasound uh, to try and figure out exactly where you are. And what you have to do is take out all of this bad stuff and if you get it out of there, now you leave a defect behind, which is here, and what will happen is this will fill in with fibrotendon. And very often we'll drill one hole in here basically to get a little bleeding in that area to encourage the fibrotendon production. So the, there's a surgical video we have uh, on our YouTube link at our website, so if you wanted to actually see the video of the operation, you could see that. So we took another look, uh, a 10 to 14 year follow-up of 150 cases uh, in 2009 and found out that the operation held up uh, following Dr. Houston's idea of having a long-term follow-up. And so we still found that there was 97% significant pain relief, 90% full return to sports 10 to 14 years later. So the success in other areas is attendance can be also good, but uh, you must remove or repair only the pathology. Now the 10X, uh, new excision technology, high intensity ultrasound, it's a tenolysis again, not a tenotomy. And Bernie Mori, my buddy at the Mayo Clinic, who is a former chair at the Mayo, uh, and uh, Bernie has been working on this, and I've been working with Bernie on this as well. Uh, and the issue is that it's a high intensity uh, probe which actually emulsifies the tissue. This is what the cataract uh, surgeons do when they emulsify a lens in, in the cataract. And, and basically what happens is that you can wash out so that you emulsify and then you can wash out uh, the tissue. So that's the whole idea, excision of the, uh, of the tissue. So here are some examples in an Achilles and an elbow, uh, patellar tendon, actually this example at the, the hypoechoic area and three months later. So sometimes that will fill in then with fibrotendon, maybe it's, it's normal tendon. 10X is an office procedure, same principles as our mini open, is it as good? We'll see. Probably not in severe pathology because you must remove all of the tendinosis tissue. Return to sport, control abuse, sports technique, the training methods, the counterforce bracing, sports equipment. Take home messages, healthy fibro tendon is pain free. Understanding the tendinosis variation and the location is critical to success, particularly the variation. Uh, anatomy is king, the need for ultrasound uh, uh, needle placement, I don't know. Uh, the standard of care can be harmful. The latest hot treatment may not work. You need careful research. And the final take home message in tendinosis is heal it or regenerate it or remove it, but leave the good stuff alone. Thanks a lot. <laughs> Uh, we use Kenalog all the time. It, 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 it's a much better, much better tool. Uh, the uh, the Depomedrol leaves plaques behind, and actually in operative uh, areas, we'd see these Depomedrol plaques in there, and so that we stop using Depomedrol. It's cheaper, so all of a sudden everybody would go to Depomedrol. But Depomedrol was, uh, you know, one of the early ones. And uh, but as we said, we we use Triamcinolone or Kenalog. It's a much much better tool. And we don't use the, uh, I use it in cortisone injections. Uh, if patients so miserable that they can't get around in life, I, I think a cortisone injection is helpful. But again, it's not curative. So that was a mistake that was made, uh, you know, years back and is still made today. I mean, everybody thought that, well, if you have pain control, you're cured. Wrong. Because you still have the, you still have the abnormal patho anatomy still sitting there.
So you got to pay your dues with the O'Connor five-step approach. Uh, <laughs> I, I use half percent lidocaine. And the reason for that is that well, I was in the Navy for a couple of years way back when, when I left the Mayo Clinic. And uh, I was injecting a bursitis in a hip in a young lady, and uh, it was supposed to be 500 milligrams of uh, lidocaine. It was supposed to be fail-safe. Anyway, I used 15 cc's of 1 percent, and the patient went into a convulsion. And at that point, I went to half percent, and the half percent works just as well. And I never had another convulsion. Uh, so anyway, it, it works just fine. So I mix, actually, for lateral elbow injection, I, I use 4 cc's of uh, half percent uh, uh, lidocaine plus uh, uh, 40, uh, 40 milligrams of Kenalog. Uh Advice. Uh, well, I have lots of advice. I have a lot of inertialisms. Uh, <laughs> one of them is if, if you operate on a normal and don't screw it up much, the results can be pretty good. Uh, <laughs> the, uh, uh, yeah, uh, well, f you know, the standard stuff is follow your passion, and I think that's good. But if you're out in practice, don't expect that you're going to be able to do all sports things. Uh, so you're, you're going to have to basically do, you know, some other things as well. But try and stick with the sports things. But uh, early in my career, I understood uh, that rehabilitative exercise and strength is important. And uh, so all of a sudden, a little lady breaks her, breaks her hip. And in the 1970s, uh, uh, she's sitting in there, and I'm saying, She's going to have to get out of bed and she's going to have to walk with a walker, so let's start strengthening her upper body. So I had the physical therapy people, before even her operation, start uh, weightlifting uh, on her upper arms uh, because cardiovascular stuff and upper body strength is important to those people. So even with 80-year-old ladies with broken hips, I, I was using the concepts of sports medicine. So you can use those concepts almost anywhere. So as we say, uh, uh, strength is... Uh, is an uh, important uh, issue, and, uh, and power is important whether or not it's military, economic, or muscle. Uh, so, so always think rehabilitation. Yep. Well, well, well the concept uh, of doing a tenotomy was to weaken the force generator. That was the whole idea. So basically, uh, what I'd say to a lot of audiences who ask that question, I'd say, would you do a tenotomy on an Achilles tendon that had tendinosis? Would you? I don't. Would that guy at the Mayo Clinic, who was in the PM&R department, I remember we had a big fight. The, the orthopedic department always, uh, always was not happy with the PM&R department, quite frankly. And uh, so the orthopedic guys tried for many years to get the PM&R department under the orthopedic wing. And Bill Cooney, who was a hand surgeon at the time, finally managed to do it, at, at least with the hand PM&R people. But the PM&R guys are basically in their own little world. Uh, even to this day at the mail. But in any event, uh, if it doesn't work to do a tenotomy on an Achilles tendon, why would you do it anywhere else? You want to you get fibro tendon in there. So if you want to do multiple needling, and if that creates the inflammatory response, uh, that may be fine. But the concept of cutting the tissue, that's what a tenotomy means. That's a different game. Now, tenotomy for Dubitron's contracture, you know, in a sense for Dubitron's, you know, multiple needlings in there, or if you're using, uh, uh, you know, the Zioflex stuff and all that for, you know, Dubitrons, that, that, that's a different game. Yep. Um, well, first of all, you don't pick an arbitrary number out of the air. You know, our government officials do that all the time. You know, they just pick a number out of the air. Uh, the, uh, the criteria is, is success. And so that performance in rehabilitation, just like performance on the sports field, so if the patient basically has excellent range of motion and has, has a good restored power uh, and pain control, that, that's your end point. Now, it doesn't make any difference whether it's four weeks or eight weeks or whatever it is. But, but as you said, power, reasonable range of motion, and, and, and reasonable pain control. And it's all right to sprinkle in a couple of uh, Advil from time to time. That's all right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, then you have to reassess what's happening. Uh, in other words, uh, what you have uh, is the diagnosis correct, amongst other things. Otherwise, there's a subset group, the workers' comp group in general, you know, who have, who have another agenda. 
And sometimes, you know, they have, they have an agenda that says it's better that I don't get well because I get paid more by not getting well than getting well. So, so that all gets involved in the process, of course. Uh, not very often, uh, you know, if you use the criteria that, you know, the, the clues that, the, the, the clues that we have. Yeah. It happened, it, it, it can happen, but, but not very often. But as I said, as you saw in the talk now, there's a lot more precision uh, to understanding the variability in, in, in the volume and the character of the tendinosis. And so, as we said, if you've got that mucoid degeneration, I'd call it a thick, unhappy tendon weeping with edema. Uh, if you've got that in there, as we said, the, the opportunity to regenerate that is a lot less. So then, as we said, you're better served. It's like in metaphor, you know, if you've got a house that basically the, the plumbing's no good and the roof has fallen down and the foundation's no, no good, you're better off to bulldoze the thing down and start fresh rather than just try to do painting and wallpapering. If you kind of follow the metaphor. Yes, Bruce. Well, uh, yeah, the whole idea is, is to remove the, uh, remove the tendinosis tissue. Now the question is, actually, you know, this, uh, the Tenex actually unit, you only do it for like, like 90 seconds. Uh, and uh, whether or not you can get all that stuff out of there and, and, and make it work, I'm not so sure. I think in the smaller, in the smaller uh, you know, pathological cases, uh, it probably works pretty well. Like that, like that uh, MRI that I showed you with the ambassador to, uh, to Sweden. Uh, when we pu put that 10x right on that spot, he, he said immediately, that's the spot. And uh, uh, so, as we said, in a really a focused area like that, as we said, I think it'll work pretty well, but uh, there's a lot of work that needs to be done yet. <laughs> Bernie Mori is, uh, is working on that uh, at the Mayo. Bernie's retired now, but uh, they've got some research projects going on, uh, you, know, at, you know, to see how it really works. But the concept is good, in other words, you remove the pathological tissue. That's the concept. Not, not just release tissue indiscriminately, not doing tenotomies indiscriminately. It's a, you gotta find the pathological tissue. Otherwise, if you're just doing the tenotomy and you leave the pathological tissue behind, uh, what have you accomplished, you know, other than weaken the force generator? No okay, I, I just want to... Um... Anyway, thank you, great questions. Say thank you to Dr. Nerschel. As Dr. Nerschel mentioned, um, as you saw in his title slide, you know, 45 years. He started the Mayo Clinic 45 years ago, and that career is coming to a close in the next uh, two months. Now, Dr. Nerschel, very busy man, very involved with his family, his church, his community, and the nation. I'm sure he's going to continue to be extremely busy, but his time in medicine is, uh, is coming to a close. And as you can see from this presentation, he's really been a giant uh, in his contributions to medicine. If you read an article about tendinopathy, it's always quoted, always cited. I thought the question from the fellow, are you a fellow? No, I'm a program director. Program director, yeah, I thought yeah, it was yeah. great. And because um, there are many of us here in this audience who have been trained, and I'll, by Dr. Nurschel, I was thinking about it, you know, what lessons have I learned? We've learned many, many lessons, but if I could just break it down to two, um, the first one from Dr. Nurschel, I believe, is it's all about the patient. It's all about the patient. Uh, I had an orthopedic surgeon, colleague of mine, recently went into private practice. Uh, he's in private practice, busy group, and uh, he was going around with another orthopedic surgeon, and he has an encounter. He's sitting down with a patient, discussing whether or not to get a metastectomy. They exit the room, and the orthopedic surgeon said, that's a cardinal mistake. You never sit down. You know, that gives the patient an opportunity to ask another question. You never sit down. You keep moving. <laughs> and I kid you not. I mean, that was the reality because he had to see his 40 patients. You know, and I can tell you as a fellow, and I know a number of people who have trained with Dr. Mitchell, whether it's an ambassador, a senator, a Supreme Court justice, Anna Kornikova, or some kid from a local high school who can't pay, they all got the same time. All of them, and they all got their questions answered. And I can tell you, he was always late. <laughs> always, you know, an hour and a half. But everybody knows they're going to get their time with Dr. Nurschel. Everybody, whomever. The second uh, lesson that I think I learned with Dr. Nurschel that I just want to share is yes, it was 1990 that I interviewed with Dr. Nurschel. I remember because my wife was pregnant, 
and my son just turned 25. Uh, but I remember Dr. Nershall said, you know, uh, Francis, only my mom and Dr. Nershall called me Francis. Um, if you come here, uh, you'll be in a place where you're going to change the way people think. Um, and Dr. Nershall, as you see from his career, has made a difference in changing the way people think. Um, I know his career is going to go on, but in medicine, Dr. Nershall, you have truly made a huge difference. You know, you have fought the good fight. And in the AMA tradition, you have run the good race. And on behalf of AMA, with this gift, we want to thank you for your contribution to medicine. around for consulting uh, uh, <laughs> in the next five or ten years. Thank you very much.